Otto Neurath was the developer of pictorial statistics, later called isotype. Here is a typical example of isotype, which effectively shows how um, the output of cloth in the uh, textile manufacturing industry uh, in England increased uh, in direct correlation with how many uh, workers were working in a factory system. It's a very elegant uh, example. It's a, it's a story of the Industrial Revolution, basically. But Otto Neurath was also a founder member of the Vienna Circle, now recognized as an important group in philosophy of the 20th century. They developed logical empiricism, a kind of analytic philosophy that firmly established itself in the English-speaking world after the Second World War. Several members of the Vienna Circle went on to be uh, established academic philosophers in the USA, including Rudolf Carnap and Philip Frank. But Otto Neurath died in 1945 in England, and he was largely forgotten for several decades. His rehabilitation in terms of inclusion in the canon of 20th century philosophy was begun by a publication in 1973 of this edition of his writings translated into English and co-edited by his widow Marie Neurath. But almost concurrent with this and before the real boom in Neurath scholarship, there was in fact recognition of the work Neurath and his colleagues in graphic design uh, did with an exhibition on isotype at the University of Reading in England in 1975 and this catalogue which was published alongside it. This resulted from all the working papers of the Isotype Institute as it had been established uh, in the UK being given to the University of Reading by Marie Neurath. And this was a transfer that was arranged by Professor Michael Twyman, the uh, founder of the typography department at Reading University. And he wrote a very useful uh, essay overview uh, of isotype work in this catalogue. This project also started the connection of design historian Robin Kinross to isotype, and he has continued to research and write on this subject up to the present day. His book about isotype, co-written with, with Marie Neurath, was published in a French edition last year. From the early 1980s, Neurath's role in 20th century philosophy has be, been covered in increasing detail, principally perhaps in German, but also in English. This is somewhat ironic because Neurath was a self-professed anti-philosopher who thought that academic philosophers were not really concerned with changing the world, which is what he wanted to do. But he wrote enough interesting essays on theories of knowledge and philosophy of science to justify all the recent attention. Yet his principal occupation, from which he made a living during the time that he was a member of the Vienna Circle and afterwards, was in making pictorial graphics for educational purposes. First at the Social and Economic Museum in Vienna, which you see here in its principal exhibition in the uh, Neues Rathaus, the big uh, Gothic town hall in Vienna. Then in exile in the Netherlands after 1934. This is uh, an exhibition they did about or around Rembrandt in 1938. And then in uh, England during the Second World War. This is a, a visualization uh, in a booklet about the um, the new social security system uh, that was being planned 
1942. But there have now been hundreds of articles and books published about the debates on language and meaning in logical empiricism and about the connection with Ludwig Wittgenstein, who was an inspirational figure for the Vienna Circle, although not particularly for Otto Neurath. This is just one example uh, by a British historian in the British Journal for the History of Philosophy. There are some studies in French. Antonia Soules edited a book about the Vienna Circle in 1983. And then this French translation of the Circle's manifesto a couple of years later. And this has recently been reprinted. The uh, title of the Vienna Circle's manifesto is The Scientific Conception of the World. Most recently, uh, a political biography of Otto Neurath has been published, uh, written by an Austrian political scientist, Gunther Sandner, uh, which does take the work in pictorial statistics very seriously. And uh, Sandner views it as an integral part of uh, Neurath's life's work. In addition, Neurath's work as an economist has been revisited also. In 1919, he was briefly the director of the Central Office of economics in the revolutionary socialist government of Bavaria, which took power in Munich after the First World War. Here he is at that time, aged 37. He was always a critic of global capitalism and an advocate of alternative thinking, which you can imagine has become quite topical these days. His ideas on war economy prefigured some ideas in the disaster capitalism identified by Naomi Klein in her book, The Shock Doctrine. And he has even been hailed as a pioneer of what is called today ecological economics. You can see there are some very serious looking academic articles all about this. As if this wasn't enough, there has also been a significant amount of scholarship on Neurath's role in urban planning and architecture in which he was involved during the 1920s and brought him into contact with architects such, a, such as Adolf Loos and Peter Behrens. An influential essay about this which has been much cited was written by the distinguished American historian of science, Peter Gallison. He drew parallels between the philosophical and architectural projects of the 1920s. But he only briefly mentions Neurath's work in pictorial education and in terms that don't seem quite right to people who know about graphic design. See, I've marked a passage here uh, on the right. He calls Neurath's museum uh, a picture museum and says that they made billboards, which is kind of implies advertising, which they didn't do. It's more or less correct, but not quite. Um, and so it makes you think that um, Gallison didn't know quite what was involved in that kind of work. More recently, lengthy studies, uh, books have been written about um, architecture, including Neurath's uh, contribution uh, to town planning uh, by Eve Blau, an American historian, and Nader Vosuyan, a younger American architectural scholar. And he uh, had this book published uh, a couple of years ago. And these um, more recent studies do the graphic design work more justice. Although it's uh, mentioned in these studies of Neurath's connection 
to architecture that he wrote an essay in 1926 when the new Bauhaus, famous Bauhaus building uh, by Walter Gropius in Dessau was opened. It seems to me that uh, what he wrote hasn't been fully addressed because it doesn't quite fit the thesis that there was a commonality between uh, philosophy of the 20s and the architectural uh, project. Because uh, this essay, Otto Neurat attended the opening of the Bauhaus building and he wrote this essay uh, straight afterwards, Das Neue Bauhaus in Dessau. But he was, he, he was uh, complimentary and enthusiastic about the Bauhaus, but he was quite critical as well. And he thought that it went too far uh, in some ways and it was all about style to some extent. Um, that the, the modernity that they were making there was somewhat superficial. And um, this shows that Neurath doesn't really fit uh, the mainstream of German uh, modernism uh, in the 20s and 30s. Uh, he was an Austrian, which is not quite the same thing as being a German. It is rare for scholars of philosophy or economics to engage seriously with Neurath's work in graphic design, with notable exceptions being Elisabeth Nemeth and Friedrich Stadler of the Vienna Circle Institute at Vienna University. But philosophy and economics are largely verbal and numerical disciplines, which leads to a general ignorance about the graphic design work of isotype. If it is mentioned at all, it can be in very misunderstood terms. So when I, as a graphic design historian and also as a, a graphic designer, approach a, a study, a historical study of isotype and Neurath, I want to prevent the reverse situation happening that if somebody from the field of philosophy or economics who's interested in the graphic work reads something that I write, they won't find uh, mistakes about their discipline uh, when reading uh, what I've written. I don't need to become an expert in uh, those fields, but it seems perverse not to engage with all this stuff that's been written uh, in recent years about Neurath when studying him now. But there's also a positive intention to explore the cross connections between different areas of this man's work, which there certainly are. Personally, I find a great sympathy with uh, Otto Neurath in his suspicion of academic philosophy. He thought that design work was just as important and did not recognize philosophy as a higher discipline. So in his spirit, I want to kind of elbow my way into these other discourses and persuade people that graphic design history is just as legit legitimate as philosophy or economics, uh, perhaps even more so than economics. Um, that term economics was on a, a blacklist of words, of uh, vocabulary that Otto Neurath had compiled since his days as a student of words that you should not use when writing because nobody really understands what they mean. Uh, and so I, I, he tried to avoid uh, using the term economics uh, when writing um, about such isu issues. All this is a contrast to the, my previous historical studies in graphic design, which concerned the typographers Paul Renner on the left and Jan Chichold on the right. The published sources for these studies came from within printing history and typographical scholarship. And in both cases, key historical sources were written by uh, the subjects themselves, which presents its own problems in that you have to be careful in taking at face value what these people have written about themselves. And the same is the case uh, with Otto Neurath, who was a very prolific writer and also about uh, progress 
of the work in developing the Vienna method of pictorial statistics, which is, was the first uh, name given to isotype, the Vienna method. There are now five volumes of Otto Neurath's collected writings in German in, these orin in this orange binding, including this one, the thickest one, about that thick, of his writings on visual education. But he also wrote much on the theory of language, naturally, given that he was a key figure in the so-called linguistic turn in philosophy of the 20th century. And there is a temptation to map those writings onto the work in isotype, which he himself referred to occasionally as picture language. But I think we have to be careful not to take the philosophical writing as a direct explanation of the graphic work or see isotype as an expression of logical empiricism. There are parallels, but Neurath never framed it in this way explicitly. And there is a danger of falling into the very trap that Neurath warned against of seeing philosophy as some kind of legitimizing agent for all other disciplines. The parallels between Neurath's linguistic analysis and isotype were examined by Ellen Lupton in this essay published in the American journal Design Issues in 1986. This is an example of a design historian seriously engaging with philosophical literature to address her subject. Her text gives a slight impression of luck in finding a ready-made opportunity to examine a case of graphic design that seems to have an affiliated body of theoretical writing. While she doesn't overstate this case, I don't think it's quite right, or I'd be careful of saying something like she says at the beginning of her second paragraph here, isotype expresses a theory of language, which I know what she means, but I'm not sure that it does. Or I there was never an intention, really, for uh, it to do so. In his later years, Otto Neurath clarified that isotype was not a language, but a language-like technique, a method of design for education, and as such it was a collaborative effort, something which is often ignored uh, when people give Neurath full credit for it. He had some artistic talent and was indeed a kind of graphic designer, but he knew the importance of working with specialists, such as the German artist Gerd Arntz, who designed the isotype pictograms. This is one of uh, a collection of his uh, designs for workers, including a, a striking worker in the top left with arms folded and an unemployed one next to him. <laughs> and uh, equally as important, uh, there was Marie Neurath, as she later became, originally uh, Marie Reidemeister, who was the principal designer of isotype charts from the very beginning. They called her role the transformer, or transformateur uh, en français, uh, which was the prototype of today's information designer. What they meant by transformation, we mean by design, I think. It was her role to analyze complex data and transform it into a pictorial sketch ready for graphic artists like Gert Arntz to uh, prepare the finished artwork. This is what Otto Neurath wrote about the centrality of this process in isotype work and how it could not be fully codified. There are many transformation rules, some hundreds of them. Since the application of the rules cannot become standardized, but each new picture needs, as it were, a somewhat new invention of combinations, there is no possibility to transfer the rules in a simple way, 
One has to become acquainted with the whole structure of rules and to learn how to weigh them from case to case, i.e. transformation needs rules plus much routine. Uh, that his emphasis is the italic that would have been underlined, I think, uh, in his original uh, script. This, it strikes me, this is still a pretty good description of what uh, design work is. So I see it as my job to bring to the fore this kind of pragmatic thinking about design when writing about Neurat and isotype. So what role is played by all this background, lateral reading that I've done uh, around philosophy and economics? When I'm writing either for a design journal about isotype uh, or for this book, uh, which was published uh, last year, uh, was the culmination of a three-year project we had at Reading University. Uh, it's, it's principally about the graphic design work um, by Neurat and his colleagues, but we hope other people will be interested in it as well. I mean, people outside of graphic design. I'm not pretending to be anything other than a graphic design historian. And so the other stuff, all the background, has to kind of stay in the background. But it allows me to touch on related issues with confidence and not make faux pas uh, or false statements in ignorance, which sometimes happens when the situation is reversed and scholars of philosophy or the history of science write about isotype. Uh, I've just remembered something. Um, I mean, I said what has interested me is kind of placing uh, this graphic design work in this network of connections of different uh, parts of culture in the 1920s and 30s. Um, but when we came to write the text for uh, the exhibition that preceded this book and is connected with it, that was held at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London in 2010, we had some short biographies of the principal figures, including Otto Neurath, and I remember there being one sentence in there saying that he was also a member of the Vienna Circle uh, of Philosophers. Uh, and because the exhibition was being held in what is still essentially an arts and crafts museum, or more a design museum these days, the editor at the Victoria and Albert Museum, we had quite a strict editor of our exhibition text, she said, no, you have to take that out, it's irrelevant. Uh, this is an exhibition about graphic design, we don't need to know about <laughs> his work in philosophy. So there was absolutely no reference to any other part of his work in that exhibition, which I'm still not quite comfortable with. But uh, to go back to my point about uh, not wanting to make mistakes about philosophy uh, or economics, if I mention them, uh, to give the opposite example of when a, a philosopher writes about isotype, or mentions it, they only generally mention it very briefly. Um, this is a, a philosopher at Stanford University um, uh, writing an article published in the journal called Studies in History and Philosophy of Science in 2009. She says that the isotype language of pictograms included the handicapped accessible symbol. It never did, and uh, that particular pictogram, which I guess you all uh, can bring to mind, was only designed in the late 1960s. But it was probably the only one that occurred to her when she was thinking about uh, pictograms. It must be self-evident from what I've said that Otto Norit was multi-talented and extremely productive, but even he couldn't design a pictogram 20 years after his own death. So. <coughs> When I was asked to talk at the annual Ludwig Wittgenstein Symposium in Austria, I took the opportunity to examine the philosophical and linguistic side of isotype to a greater extent. But I didn't change my approach very much. It's still 
a historical approach based on archive research, I examined the question of the linguistic status of isotype, but with the insight of being a, a designer and knowing what's involved in designing graphic objects, um, with a sensitivity to the material aspect of the work. I tried to examine any evidence of Neurath having actively developed isotype as a picture language. This is obviously a strong piece of evidence for uh, him having done so, because this is still really the, the best summary of isotype work, a book he wrote called International Picture Language in 1936. But it's deceiving because this book was written in something called Basic English, which is now making a comeback, I think, on the internet. And in, uh, there's a Basic English version of Wikipedia, I think. Um, basic English is a, has a very restricted vocabulary of only about a thousand words. And he was kind of forced into a corner here in having to call it a language because he would have had to use too many other words to say something sensible about it. Instead, I, I needed to look at Neurath's correspondence, the letters he wrote uh, to, in particular, the philosopher Rudolf Carnap, with whom he had a discussion of terminology. And it, it became clear that before moving into the English language, uh, I mean, Neurath, uh, after he left Austria in 1934, he began to write almost exclusively in English. Uh, he had, but in German, he had referred to the uh, Vienna method of pictorial statistics as a picture script, not a picture language, but a script. And I can point to the discrepancy between his approach to language and that of the philosopher uh, Rudolf Carnap. There's a, a quotation from Carnap at the top about his uh, discussion with. Uh, Neurath and how they differed. And at the end of it, Carnap is saying that uh, it wasn't the physical properties or the ink marks uh, of graphic language which were important. It was some kind of geometrical structural pattern, something more abstract. And this is the main difference between them. Uh, he had this kind of idealized view of language comes from the German uh, philosophical tradition uh, of a, an abstract entity, uh, whereas Neurath was uh, involved from the 1920s in making these graphic artifacts, and it was the marks of ink on the paper that were uh, the important thing for him. And again, in this uh, situation, I find myself on Neurath's side. Uh, I find myself an ally uh, of him, uh, the professed anti-philosopher, because he was suspicious of too much theory. As someone who was involved in making um, artifacts, for example, when he was corresponding with the uh, American uh, Charles Morris, who was uh, one of the most important figures in developing semiotics, um, around the Second World War. Uh, Neurath said that he didn't really believe in semiotics. Uh, he thought it was going too far, too soon, uh, and describing things that we didn't really understand how they worked. And he didn't like semantics either. He thought theory was suspicious. Too much theory was a questionable thing. In uh, the book I showed you earlier, International Picture Language, Neurath pointed out that isotype could not translate verbal language word for word, but it did have some basic syn syntactical rules which were established during the Vienna period. The basic rule is that pictogram units should not be increased in size to indicate an increase in quantity, as you see on the left, and he captioned as a bad example, but they should be repeated instead in greater numbers at the same size. And after initial years of experiment, it was also resolved to line the pictograms up always on the horizontal axis, uh, not in vertical 
uh, rows with time running on the vertical axis. Arranged this way, Neurath likened the pictograms to letters composed in a printed line. Some examples were prepared around 1936 to show how statements such as uh, boy walking from house to tree should be shown in isotype. So you have a not isotype example where there's a separate picture element for each word, but then you have isotype, which is more a kind of a synth synthetic pictorial description uh, of the same thing. So again, not isotype and isotype. These make clear that isotype has no components that are directly equivalent to words in many cases, but it would be difficult to interpret rules which dictate that these statements should be conveyed in precisely the approved configurations that are given here. Perhaps this was the point that there should always be a flexibility to allow for economical and creative solutions. So it's clear that pictograms are not atomic or indivisible units of language, despite the dis deceptive simplicity with which Gert Arndt designed them. They're full of conventional and historical baggage and associations. Sometimes isotype is criticized for being a naive utopian project in its attempt to create timeless international images. For example, it's a mistake to think that isotype is irredeemably flawed because this car pictogram is now out of date. And it's ridiculous to imagine that Otto Neurath, who was involved in complex debates about language and representation, did not realize this. Indeed, he addressed this matter in his book, International Picture Language. The fact that you might have to change the appearance of a pictogram to update a chart like this did not negate the whole method. And in Neurath's view, the method was more important than the pictograms themselves. I want to turn now briefly to uh, Neurath's economic theory and how it influenced isotype work. Well, the matter of economy was central to the Vienna method of pictorial statistics from the beginning because it was developed at the Social and Economic Museum of Vienna, which Neurath had conceived and founded. But he wanted to show, how, show people how economics impacted ordinary people's lives. And this explains certain themes that frequently recurred in the charts that they made. For example, unemployment, this shows, uh, just incidentally, the remarkable fact that uh, between 1920 and 1928 there was almost no comparable uh, unemployment in France uh, when it was well over a million in uh, Great Britain and Germany. Uh, and another basic theme uh, were births and deaths, usually correlated, sometimes correlated with standard of living and this shows a, a, a standard isotype device of having this uh, central dividing line which shows a surplus of a certain uh, amount here, showing a surplus of deaths over births during the First World War. And to some extent, uh, showing the economic impact on ordinary lives uh, is to do with uh, access to health care as well. So this shows that... Um, how is rickets in uh, in French? Rachitisme. Yeah. A direct reference to the history of political economics is shown in this chart made at the Vienna Museum in 1933, which bluntly contradicts Malthus's famous theory that population will eventually exceed uh, 
food supply. The outlined people here each indicate agricultural capacity for 100 million people in addition to the existing population in colours uh, marked by different kinds of economic activity. This chart is peculiar in having such a tende tendentious title because isotype charts generally had neutral and unemotional titles. Isotype charts were meant to convey their subject through self-explanatory pictograms, but there was one exception, money. This is the pictogram for money held in the working dictionary of uh, pictograms of the Isotype Institute. You could see it as an isotype pictogram, round, like a coin, with no added detail, but it also becomes a purely abstract circle. Here is a chart from uh, Gesellschaft und Wirtschaft, Society and Economy, which was a, a folder of a hundred separate charts, which is a high point of isotype work from 1930. And if you don't understand German, then the subject of this chart won't be clear to you at all. You won't know what it's about. In comparison, this chart from the same publication, if you don't read German, you at least you know it's about automobiles. You know it's something about cars and the increasing number of them. And then if you notice that it says USA at the top, you can perhaps work out that uh, to the left of the line is the, the USA and on the other side is the rest of the world. But this one, you know, there, there's no pictorial communication. Uh, what it shows is um, export uh, trade of important trading nations. And I think uh, the people who made these isotype charts would have been quite content with this because um, these charts using the blank circle for money are rare in the work that they made. Only eight of the charts in this publication of a hundred used it uh, and it was part of the philosophy behind isotype that the chart should deal with objects of more intrinsic meaning to people, the material of life. In Neurath's economic theory money had no value in itself, only the valuations we place on it. This view was reflected in an intriguing essay that Neurath wrote during the last Great Depression, I mean the one before the one that we're in now, uh, in the 1930s. This is an essay called World Planning and the USA. And it makes clear that much of what is happening today is not new. Neurath asked how we could explain to a Martian what an earthly economic crisis is. What do you mean by a crisis, asks a man from Mars. At first he would not understand us if we tried to tell him what unprecedented confusion results when, in a space packed with shouting human beings and called the stock exchange, certain numerals on a board dwindle day by day. And then if you uh, skip down to the second paragraph, at the bottom left, but a man from Mars would be quick to grasp the significance of shelter, food, clothing, books, sports, and the like. This is a significant observation with regard to isotype because these things, along with people, were suitable for being shown in pictorial terms, in pictorial form. This is a, a slightly uh, a later example from Neurath's great book, Modern Man in the Making. Uh, an economic scheme. As you can see, money is not depicted directly. It's about people and the objects that they make or deal with. Abstract theories or formulas are not suitable subjects for isotype. Neurath fully admitted this limitation, but he thought it was a strength because it avoided straying into metaphysical areas where there was a danger of creating meaningless statements. 
to finish with, I'd like to share a joke uh, with you that Otto Neurath made in his first long published uh, essay about isotype uh, in English called Museums of the Future. This was uh, published in 1933. He's writing here about the need to avoid both abstraction and crude facts when making pictorial material for education. If you see uh, halfway down the first paragraph on the left, he says, the well-known story of the camel may help to illustrate my meaning. I don't know if this was a well-known story or if he made it up. I've never heard it elsewhere. A Frenchman is asked, what is a camel? He, I, I, I will preface this. I'm only saying this because it deals with national stereotypes, including the French, and may be amusing. But the Germans come out of it worse, so that's okay. A Frenchman is asked, what is a camel? He goes to the Paris Zoo and asks someone to show him a camel. There is none. So he travels to Marseille, then to Bordeaux. Nowhere can he find one. And the malicious rumor has it that on his return, he reports, there is no such thing as a camel. The German, confronted with the same problem, follows a very different procedure. He sits down and thinks and thinks and thinks, and the camel is there. The American, as an empiricist, again, follows a wholly different method. He buys himself a lasso, leases a yacht, and travels to Africa, where he catches a camel, which he brings back to New York and exhibits, saying, here is an idea of the camel. You have to remember, this is 1933, when the first King Kong movie was made, when they did something very similar. And then he continues in parenthesis, there is a sequel to this story. Each of the three writes a book. The Frenchman bears the title, Sonnets to the Unknown Camel. The German names his, The Absolute Camel and the Metaphysical Principle of its Antithetical Being. <laughs> and the American proclaims, Two records, the largest camel and the one that can live longest without food, is to be seen in New York. <laughs> and then he says, to, to come to the point, uh, I think he was really off the point uh, here, um, but um, anyway, on that irrelevant, largely irrelevant note, uh, I will finish my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>